Everybody had a shitty night? <laughs> okay, good morning, and okay, let's have a great day. And our first speaker, Victoria, small applause for her, please. Guys, for those of you who made it this morning, I extend my heartfelt appreciation. I really appreciate you. Um, so thank you so much. It's always difficult, I think, in these sorts of situations when you're starting to establish a reputation. No one really knows who you are, so it does take a while before people realise that you have something to say that's worth listening to. But fortunately, because this is being live streamed, hopefully those that can't make it, or maybe sitting in their hotel beds watching it, will get something out of it today. So the aim of today's talk is to extend the conversation that we started yesterday, and it's specifically... Um, the economic aspects of Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin is a new form of money. And I think this is a really interesting topic because, you know, money is something that none of us are able to avoid in our daily experiences to such an extent that if we get to the stage where we feel as if we're in control of our lives and this is a subject that we have mastered, it's something that we don't have anything left to learn about, really. And of course, so this is part of the problem when we're trying to talk to our friends and family about Bitcoin as a new form of money. You know, if you try and introduce a new idea to them, the response you're met with is, well, you know, I don't need your uh, Ponzi scheme um, technology that's used by criminals, so forget it. You've got nothing new to tell me. But of course, what they don't realize is that although they, th although they think they understand money, the truth of the situation, as this audience is well aware, that's not actually uh, the full story. And so, you know, as part of this talk, I wanted to kind of go back to some of the basics which and provide you with some valuable insights that I've not heard others talk about. And hopefully by doing this, it gives you more material to actually use when you're having these conversations with your friends and family. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Victoria Jones and I'm the author of the book Truth Decay, How Bitcoin Fixes This. And I authored this book in 2019 and published it in March 2020, which was really annoying from a marketing perspective, as I'm sure you can imagine. Nevertheless, um, it's already been featured on Book Authority's Best 100 Bitcoin Books of All Time. Um, and I'm quite proud of that. The last time I looked, uh, it was ranked at number 23. I don't think it's on the list at the moment, but it did actually get that high, which I thought was... Great, considering I was a first-time author, and I'm always happy to have an award if anyone wants to give me one. So, um, so basically, um, the premise of the book basically tells my story. For those of you who don't know, um, for the first 20 years of my career, I actually worked as a dentist. And the interesting thing about having worked as a dentist, particularly in the UK, is that you've got different ways in which healthcare services are delivered. You've got healthcare services that are delivered, that are funded and managed by the government, and you've got healthcare services that are funded and managed by the private sector. And I had an opportunity to work in many different environments uh, on this. And so what that meant was that I gained a great deal of insight about money as it works in the real economy, You know what we're actually dealing with on the ground when it comes to this subject. Um, and so it taught me a lot about politics, about how money works, and particularly human beings when it comes to their emotions involved with money as well. So going back to the subject of this topic, you know, what is money? You know, if I start to investigate a new topic, one of the first places that I try and start is with a definition. Because as I said earlier, you know, sometimes what we think something means is actually very dif different to what it actually means, and it's only in the process of searching for the definition that we actually discover that. And so when you start to look for the definitions of money, what you find is you get all of these other definitions, and you've also got characteristics to negotiate, and you also you almost need a dictionary to go through all of these other definitions as well. And so, you know, looking at it from the surface, it's actually uh, quite a convoluted and confusing topic. It's almost as if uh, people deliberately wanted us to see it this way. And this is one of the reasons... This is one of the reasons why it's a very difficult subject to get to the basics of before you can start to have a sensible conversation. And so having dug deeply into this subject, basically what it boils down to is trade. Um, what we need money for is a way to exchange values, value with each other. And so what I decided to do is go back to the first time in history where people really started to look at this and had something you know, uh, solid and, fa and fundamental in order to share on this topic. And the person that I looked at was um, a chap called Adam Smith, who was around in the 1770s. 
you know, he was one of the first people to actually sit down and write and analyse very carefully what was going on when people actually started to trade with each other. And so the first thing he talks about in his book, The Wealth of Nations, is this aspect of trading. And the first thing that he points out is that in order for someone to be able to trade with each other, the first thing that they need is property rights. Um, the person who is buying from another person needs the ability to own something, and the person who's selling to them needs the ability to own something. The buyer is passing on something that they value to the seller who's exchanging something that they also value. And so in order for this process to operate, you know, this system needed to be voluntary. The two parties involved ultimately needed to both benefit from the transaction and ultimately it benefited the most when it was honest. You know, if someone sells you something and they give you a chicken in exchange and the chicken dies the next day, okay, fair enough, you may be able to eat it that night for dinner, but clearly you're not going to be able to hold on to it to produce eggs for you and you're certainly not going to be able to use it to trade with somebody else. And so in that situation, it turns out that the trade is rather disappointing and affects the reputation between the buyer and the seller and brings some negativity into that transaction. So the more honest you can make the tr this trade, uh, the better off everyone will be. And the other thing that's interesting about Adam Smith when he was writing in the 1770s is that they were actually using silver as a form of currency. And so this is a coin from 1770. You can see from this silver coin, it was a British coin, but you can already see you know, the, the brown showing through where it was already starting to be mixed with other metals. And Adam Smith reports that in his book in 1776, that at this stage, the British pound was already one third silver. So it already had two thirds of its metal swapped for something else. Uh, in comparison, the Scottish pound was already one thirty six silver. And the, four, and the poor French were dealing with a currency where the French pound and penny was just one sixty six silver. And actually, this is a really important piece of information and one that we're not often told about commonly because 1776 was just 13 years prior to the French Revolution. Um, and what most people don't realise is that a big part of what contributed to the French Revolution was the debasement of the currency. It actually got to the stage where the currency had been debased so badly that the authorities in France decided to revalue all of the property in France and uh, issue assignats in order to reflect that property, and this was going to be the new currency. And what then happened was the people in the city who knew what was going on ended up absolutely minting it. But the poor people in the countryside, who had no idea what was going on, ended up completely impoverished. And of course, this is why they ended up storming the Bastille, because they were completely impoverished. Their ability to trade honestly with each other had been stolen from them. And this is now in our current culture, you know, with the innkeeper from Les Miserables, you know, parodying, you know, exactly how bad and how, you know, um, depressing it can become for, uh, you know, human beings who end up in that situation. It really does tend to bring out the worst in humanity uh, when we get to that level. And so the influence of hyperinflation uh, and its contribution to the French Revolution is something that we need to be uh, really mindful of. So Adam Smith, when he was talking about trade, he was really keen to emphasise, you know, this ability to trade with each other honestly is really what contributed to prosperity. You know, those who had the ability to trade honestly, they um, were able to, they tended to work harder, they tended um, to reward each other better. You know, humanity, human, humanity is hardwired to reward others who help them to solve their problems. And also, human beings are inherently creative, creative, and they find it very rewarding to solve problems. And so, you know, this interaction with each other, where we're allowed to trade, is actually can be very re rewarding. And if you're being rewarded properly for it, you know, people get a great deal of satisfaction from that. Um, and in using their services um, to help the nation prosper, um, is rewarding for everybody. Uh, Adam Smith was also keen to praise the banks at the time because, you know. In trading with metals, it was very hard and very bulky, and so by having the banks who were able to store the metals and then distribute currency in return for, um, you know, that safe storage, uh, really helped that this aspect of trade um, to prosper. Um, and of course, by the late 18th century, the majority of Europe was on the gold standard, and there was a great deal of prosperity uh, through the Industrial Revolution as a result of some of these ideas. But Adam Smith also had a really 
interesting insight that I think is really worth while considering, um, especially given some of the discussions that we're having right now. And this is, and he said, you know, it was not by gold or by silver, but by labor that all the wealth of the world was originally purchased. And so when it comes to talking about money, I think it's really important to emphasize it's not the fact that gold has been around for 5,000 years as a form of money that makes it a good money. It's also not the fact that the US government is gonna come after you with their guns if you don't use their money that makes it a valuable source of money. Ultimately, it boils down to what uh, producers and workers in the economy are prepared to accept in reward for their labor that ultimately is the best form of money that will help um, you know, the, the prosperity of a nation. And so, yeah, this was written by Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, 1776. And so the other thing that he was really uh, keen to comment on was prices. You know, he said prices were a really important signal in the market. You know, if something was scarce, it tended to make the price more expensive. If it was more abundant, it tended to make um, the price cheaper. And so, you know, once you start to introduce distortions into the market, for example, with something like a monopoly, you know, a monopoly is able to hold back supply in the market to make things artificially expensive. And so you're no longer getting a correct price signal about whether or not there's supply available or it's not. And so, you know, once you're starting to distort that basic data, all of your other economic calculations that proceed from that um, are already problematic because your core data has already been corrupted. And so, again, when we're looking at modern economics, it's worth realizing that, you know, even though um, you've got economists giving you a lot of information all of the time, you know, some of the basic data has already been corrupted. And so, you know, this really influences how accurate some of our predictions can be made using some of these mathematical models. And so, you know, based on some of the things Adam Smith said, you know, all of these things are linked, you know, trading influences markets, which influences prices, which influences how much you're paying for labor, how much, um, you know, workers can receive for their labor, depending on how competitive their skills are. And all of this depends on what Adam Smith called the great wheel of circulation, because everything relies on this. And the moment you start to corrupt this, everything else starts to break down. So as I said, you know, as a result of some of these ideas, by the end of the 18th century, things were working very well. The, gold, the banks were operating with a gold standard. There were still occasions where you would get individual bank failures, um, but for the most part, those issues were isolated and things were recovered from quickly. But of course, it was still um, pretty critical for, for some individuals. And so the government came up with this idea, well, you know, if we link all of the banks together, then clearly when these happen, the other banks can support them and we will avoid this problem in the future. But of course, that may well be the solution short term, but the longer term, you, you set up a situation where you create an even bigger problem. And so where did it all go wrong? And the key part where it eventually went wrong was the First World War. I'm not sure if many of you know this, but basically when they were trying to fund the First World War, they tried to issue bonds in order to fund it, and only a third of the bonds were actually bought up. And so they were left with a problem. How were they going to fund the other two thirds of the cost that they needed for this war? And um, so the idea they came up with was that they would temporarily suspend the gold standard in order to fund the war, and then whoever lost the war would be left with the cost in order to, in order to get everyone back on the gold standard. So they thought, yes, this was a great plan. And so for the first time in history, a war was fought where there was no limit on um, the amount of resources that could be thrown at fighting this, this battle. And of course, we all know that the First World War ended up being the most devastating conflict that we know of in history. And was, this was mainly because they had infinite resources with which to fund it. Of course, eventually, uh, Germany was the one who, was, who lost the war, and they ended up with the war reparations. And again, really interesting, I was always told about the war reparations that Germany were landed with after the First World War which ultimately led to the Weimar hyperinflation. But what they neglected to tell us was the accounting trick that actually led to the necessity for those reparations in the first place. Really important detail to understand. And so, you know, this is what they were doing in Europe. Russia thought, oh, that's a great idea. We'll do a similar thing too. But their finances weren't as robust. They'd already fought a war in 1905. And so as soon as they tried it, their economy collapsed much more quickly. 
And so, of course, you know, like most of these pattern, patterns in history, when you start to examine them, it was the point at which the um, economy of the workers had been devastated that, that sows the seeds for revolution. And of course, in this situation, um, the leaders convinced the workers that the problem was the fact that there were too many rich people who'd accumulated all of the wealth, and so they needed to confiscate the wealth of everybody in order to redistribute it fairly, and of course this was the foundation of communism. But of course it was a complete trick, because as Adam Smith pointed out to us, without property rights we lose the ability to save. And so this was the ultimate betrayal of the workers, because saving is their only opportunity they have to get ahead. And so by you know, persuading them that it was by cancelling the property rights of everybody they could redistribute it fairly, um, you know, they were left in a situation where they were completely dependent on their central planners in order to move ahead. And so we're now in a situation in the West where we've kind of got this uneasy balance between um, you know, a free market economy and central planning. You know, the beginning of um, the break of the gold standard in, first, in the First World War, um, although the, the original idea had been for the person who lost the war to kind of get everyone back on the gold standard because of the German hyperinflation, you know, the expenses were just too much for Germany to cope with. And so they never actually achieved that. And so what a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, some of the biggest political battles at the beginning of the 20th century all revolved around how they were going to get Europe back onto the gold standard. And so these are, these are actually the founding arguments that led to um, the uh, Roaring Twenties, um, the 1929 stock market crash, the Great Depression. You know, this is where Keynes became involved and came up with these ideas of how to manage money in the economy. But ultimately, it was all an excuse for the grave error that they made when they started World War I. But as a result of the fact that you now we've now got um, this miasma of account of economic calculations in order to keep our economy going, um, you know this is what enables um, our modern society. And so we live in this um, environment that's kind of not really a free market, and it's not a completely central planned uh, market either. You know we live in what's called a democracy because in the in a situation of central planning, it's not a case of whether you have a plan or you don't have a plan. You know, the real question is, well, whose plan are you following? And so the idea with democracy is if you don't like the plan, you've got a chance to push back against it. But of course, in an effort to make everybody happy, it's a really difficult thing to do. In a situation where, you know, you have to make hard decisions and be unpopular, you know, when your power actually depends on your popularity, it very rarely happens. And so the reality is, in order to keep everyone happy, the easiest thing to do is just say yes to everybody and then find a way to pay for it. And of course, this is why, even though things on the ground seem fairly stable, behind the scenes, you know, the truth of the situation is our debt is exploding exponentially because in an effort to say yes to everybody, um, but still allow our lives to function, this is what's actually happening behind the scenes. And so this is a graph of um, the US debt and how that's accumulated, and that's how that's accumulating. You can see how in the first part of um, the 20th century, it was still kept fairly level, but of course the key here is that you've still got people who were alive, who remembered how the world operated on the gold standard. And it's only once they were no longer part of the political system that this started to be allowed to take off because you now have people who are running the economy who don't remember what it used to be like. And so, you know, less and less people are inclined to fight against it. So we've now got this graph of debt that's extending exponentially. And so you get to a stage where your eyes start to glaze over when anyone mentions it, you know, million, billion, trillion, what does that even mean? And for most people, you know, they've just got no way of conceptualizing what that is. And so when I do these presentations, I like to give them a little animation which helps to illustrate this for you. So you've got a hundred dollar bill here that's been piled into a um, million dollars. Uh, no, that's a million dollars, that was ten thousand uh, dollars. This is a billion dollars, so a billion dollars of hundred dollar notes on a pallet. But the jump from a billion to a trillion is absolutely staggering. These are pallets of billion dollar notes that would literally fill up an airport run runway. And if you stack them on top of each other, you know, a trillion dollars would be equivalent of a New York skyscraper that's higher than the Statue of Liberty. And of course, this animation was made in 2017 when the US debt was just 20 trillion. But when I checked the US debt clock just last week, that total is now at 30, 
30 trillion. And this is just the US. If you look at debt all around the world, you know, we've now got to the stage where total debt is almost 400 trillion. So a lot of people argue, they say, well, you know, why don't we just write it off and start again? But what a lot of people don't realize is that all of this debt is paying interest to somebody. Um, and that interest is, you know, one person's debt is someone else's asset. And of course, these assets are now stored in our pension funds. They're also stored in the wealth of our properties and also the other hard assets that people are holding on to in order to store their wealth, including Bitcoin. And so the problem is, is the moment you start to destroy this debt, you destroy the value of people's assets as well. So, you know, this is why we've now got this uneasy situation in the economy where we're starting to see um, an increase in prices. And this is because, you know, the people who manage uh, our financial system are starting to lose control of it. In an effort to lose control of it, they're starting to, lose, they're starting to raise interest rates. But, of course, that's having an effect on the assets. And this is why, even though Bitcoin is an inflation hedge, it's not actually acting like one in this particular environment. It doesn't mean it won't eventually, but this is why it's working like that right now. And so, you know, if you look back in history, it's hyperinflation that literally destroys economies and in its beginning of most revolutions. You know, the end of the Roman Empire occurred as a result of the um, debasement of the currency in Rome, um, and that was associated with the leader Nero, um, most people have heard of, you know, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Um, you know, really dysfunctional leader in that kind of situation. Then, of course, we've got the French Revolution, which led to the rise of Napoleon. And then, of course, we've got the Weimar, Weimar hyperinflation, which led to um, the rise of Hitler. So, you know, these situations where the general public doesn't understand what's happening in the real economy can lead to some really dysfunctional leaders. And this is why, you know, our money is so tied up with politics at the moment. You know, our governments are managing the way in which our fiat system works. But when it breaks down and people start to lose faith in their leaders, they often end up choosing a bad leader, which is something that I think we all need to be aware of. So how have people actually escaped these situations in the past? Well, if we go back to Weimar Germany, you've got a situation where German marks, the value of them started to explode against the value of gold. And considering this happened in the 1920s, this is entirely logical. You know, the people of Germany remembered what it was like when um, their economy worked based on the gold standard, so it was logical for them to want to go back to this. But in modern times, you know, in hyperinflations in Venezuela and Romania and Zimbabwe, in those situations, people have gravitated towards the US dollar because it's the US dollar that's seen as the strongest form of currency. But of course, you can see from the chart that I've just shown you, the US dollar is now starting to become a very dysfunctional currency behind the scenes. So where do people run to? I mean, people are speculating that we'll go back to gold because, you know, that's been a form of money for 5,000 years. But we've also seen that actually, you know, gold can be corrupted, even especially when um, we're relying on the banks in order to hold its value for you. You know, banks have been shown not to be trusted, especially when they're all linked together and they're colluding in order to um, serve their interests rather than ours. So where does this leave us? You know, ultimately, if we go back to, to property rights and what Adam Smith pointed out in terms of trading, um, you know, if you reflect on the kinds of money that we've had in the past, this has really influenced the kind of um, society we've ended up living in. Under the gold standard, when you're relying on property um, or hard uh, property in order to, in order to uh, manage your wealth, uh, your property rights can be granted and withdrawn by the king. So, for example, when Norman the Conqueror invaded the UK, he part partitioned up the land and gave it out to all his buddies, and that was the new aristocracy. But by the same token, if one of them fell out of favour, he then had the ability to take that property back from them. And so all of the wealth of, of those times was very much dependent on the king. Similarly, um, in the time of Henry VIII, once he persuaded... Uh, the local population, that the Catholic Church couldn't be trusted, and so therefore he should dissolve all the monasteries. Ultimately, he just ended up stealing all their wealth. Their treasures ended up in his treasury. And so, of course, this is how uh, the monarchs were able to manage the finances of the country. So, of course, we moved on from the gold standard and ended up with the fiat standard. But, but of course, in this situation, you've got property rights that are granted and withdrawn by the government. You know, they'll give you a license to hold a piece of land in order for you to build a property. But along with that land comes a bill for your council tax or property tax. 
And of course, at the moment, you know, it's still it's still um, worth more to you to hold the property and um, accept the cost of the property tax. But of course, when the government's in control of it, you know, who knows when that uh, balance could be tipped in the other direction. And of course, you've then got an asset that's very difficult to, li to liquidate, even though you can live in it, uh, but it certainly limits your choices. Not only that, we've got the central pal planners behind the central planners who now want us to buy into this narrative, which is you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. And actually, once you understand that the basics of trading all depends on property rights, and property rights depends on our, uh, we rely on those in order to trade and um, be prosperous, which results in our happiness, you couldn't actually come up with a more ludicrous statement. However, we now have the opportunity for Bitcoin, a Bitcoin standard, where property rights are now being going to be granted and withdrawn by the, so and withdrawn by the sovereign individual. You've now got the, 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 the ability for the smartest and brightest to own their own property rights. And the benefit of this is because they hold a form of currency that is the most honest and has the most integrity, it means that they're able to build business relationships that are going to be the most honest and have the most integrity. And what that then means is that you know, people will prefer to trade with these individuals than they will with others. And so I would argue that it's only a matter of time before you know, the average person gravitates to this way of being because ultimately history has shown that this is the way in which we tend to be happy and prosperous. And so ultimately, Bitcoin gives us a new form of money that it's very difficult to remove using violence. It's almost impossible to steal from us using fraud. Um, and in the words of Adam Smith, it gives us the opportunity to return the great wheel of to return integrity to the great wheel of circulation, and thereby and thereby start to undo some of the corruption. Uh, and many aspects of corruption that have been allowed to enter the system, you know, by using a form of sound money in the in the economy, we now we let we now allow the other wheels to turn in a way that has more integrity. Therefore, it's not incumbent on us to petition governments in order to take more wealth from the rich in order to give things to the poor. Our mission is actually to empower the workers to give them a form of currency that allows them to trade honestly and with integrity, and thereby we are introducing prosperity, not just to those individuals, but also to our communities and also to our countries. So when I first started attending these lectures and got interested in Bitcoin, I put my ideas together in a poem just because I think it's a fun way to try and share those with others. So I'm sharing these with you now. If you like it, you might want to share it with your uh, friends and family because it just kind of encapsulates some of the stories, some of the issues that we're dealing with now and perhaps indicates where we're going in the future. So I'll share that with you now and then I'll finish off by sharing my details and that will be the end of my talk. So here we go. Satoshi's page. They call me Cassandra. Some say that's my name, because those that surround me can't handle the blame. The economy is failing, you'd think they'd be scared, but when all's said and done, the problem's not theirs. Teachers in schools, wash the children's clothes, breakfast they give, pizza and toast. Round and round, the impoverished go, to the minds of the rich, the realisation is slow. In the company of homes, I will write Jack. Whilst depression is moving, he laughs, puffing right back. The comfort of those who can't see past their nose. Oh, heaven help them, but that's how it goes. Time it is ticking, it now won't be long. Wily Coyote can't tell the cliff is gone. Don't say you weren't warned before all this is done. You thought they were crazy, but the Bitcoin has won. When it is all over, and the truth it is told, the story of crisis, it never gets old. The elites in their castles, their fortunes to fold. Economists and politicians, left out in the cold. A new world is rising, paper is no more. Money has died, and so has the law. Decay and corruption that went to its core. The blockchain has spoken, no truth like it before. The rules of the software, release, or a new game. What will we choose at the dawn of a new age? A potential to trap, trumped by Satoshi's page. 
a triumph as the devil nurses his rage. So history goes, and what will it bring? A fairer society, or form a new king? A new set of rules around us to ring, but with many more choices, a new song it will sing. Our future is fluid, no need to be scared, but rules then and now will need to be compared. A time for philosophy and careful thought. We still have volition, our future's not bought. Softly, softly, tread carefully, now wait. There's no going back once you open the gate. By all means look back, but in truth it's too late. The dollar fiat Ponzi scheme has sealed all of our fates. Step into the future as boldly as you can. The wisdom of the past needs to inform your plan. The old energies are changing, the negativity is done. Kindness and compassion and creativity have won. It may still seem dark, the new light only a spark. But trust me, it's coming, this ride in the park. We are here to create it, the world we were promised. Every soul on the earth now has the opportunity to comment. The domain of the world, no longer ruled by the few. The power we have, if only we knew. Released from their shackles, humans are free to create everything as it was always meant to be. But careful here, for surely you know the evil within you has potential to show. So be mindful and careful, but also carefree. The truth you have known, and so it shall be. For love is the energy leading us on to the true potential we were always meant to become. satoshispage.com and various social media profiles so if you're interested in um, anything more that I have to say by all means look for me there. I've got a website uh, where you can sign up for a newsletter if you're interested in that. I don't post often but you know normally uh, when I feel like I have something to say. Um, also there's a QR code here for the book if you're interested. There are some postcards on the desk with it as well if you decide that you want to pursue that. And thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Victoria, and now Josh, the next dog. Uh, obsessively to 
uh, too Bitcoiny <laughs> because I think by this stage we could have been a lot larger. But it was Bitcoin and physical gold, and it was an order book where, uh, and it still is, where people can trade uh, between Bitcoin and physical gold. Um, but we, we noticed that we, we have a lot of um, we have a lot of freelancers and uh, working for us a long time, and uh, and always from 2015 to to around 2020, people always invoiced us in Bitcoin and later on Ethereum once Ethereum had been uh, had been launched. And uh, 2020 came along and people started invoicing us in this filthy tether shit. It's like, uh -huh. what do you want? Te what do you want tether for? You as well, you know. And uh, and and really, it, it made total sense. I, I don't know. If, I always get the reply, if I give another invoice to my accountant that says Bitcoin, but the price has changed since then, plus uh, plus all sorts of, uh, he's basically going to drop me as a client. And uh, so I would rather just invoice in a dollar, get a dollar, and uh, then I'll buy the speculative assets with that afterwards. And it just makes account much easier. Oh, okay, all right, I'll put aside my Bitcoin obsession for a second and grant you that. And so that, that's really um, what's, what's behind, I, I feel, in, in terms of trade, the stablecoin obsession. But also, when we look at why Tether launched in the first place, it was because exchanges like ours, back in 2015, had such a hard time dealing with banks. In fact, you needed a full, well, two full-time staff constantly opening up new bank accounts because they would close them faster than you could open them, or just as fast. And, um, and so a lot of the exchanges, Kraken, BTCE, or um, uh, uh, even Coinbase, um, but Coinbase had Silicon Valley Bank, so it was, it was pretty solid, but um, it, it, they, they would constantly close them. So any new exchange, what basically happened, they said, okay, how do we deal with fiat? And then Tether said, we'll create this thing, and uh, you guys can use that uh, uh, instead of a bank. And so then uh, exchanges uh, blew out, and, uh, and it really helped the industry a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, obviously people know how much milk costs and stuff like that, and the local currency, uh, business, businesses need stability, uh, it, it, like I mentioned, it's much better for, for accounting. Um, yield farming and, and DeFi is also interesting because you don't have uh, as much impermanent loss um, in, in that because they're stable by definition. And uh, a way to protect yourself from inflation is by basically borrowing against that. And, and going basically short because you, you're, if you've borrowed against um, some, something like Bitcoin, then you have uh, dollars and, and the inflation is paying off your debt. Uh, programmable currency, and this is all the stuff we love about Bitcoin, you can still get a stablecoin and program it um, and uh, obviously stay independent in, in, depending on which uh, you know, structure you take for your stablecoin. And, and talking of structures, you, you basically have three different types. Centralized one to one, where you have a bank, you say, I've got this many dollars, and I'm going to issue you ERC 20s against them. You've got al algorithmic fluff, and uh, where you basically take your government's token and say that that's backing uh, all the value. We saw that in Terra Luna, terrible Luna. And uh, asset backed, um, which is basically taking, uh, yeah, I mean, asset backed's interesting. You could take, uh, you can have mixtures of centralized one to one for asset backed. Um, or you can have something like MakerDAO or Money on Chain uh, or what we're building at the standard uh, where you lock up assets into a smart contract and say that that value is worth more than the, uh, the, the amount borrowed. Um, so centralized nightmare, obviously they can freeze accounts, they, you, you can have bad management, like, like um, Taylor is highly, probably most likely highly over collateralized because they were reckless enough to buy Bitcoin in the 2017 dump and uh, uh, with all their customers' funds. And, and so it, they're probably way over collateralized and some have speculated that they're up there with BlackRock <laughs> and, uh, with the amount of value that they've got now. But um, uh, it, it, it could have gone totally bad as well. So you have bad management and we don't know, are they just you know, feathering their own nests, the management of Tether? Are they just buying mansions and stuff around the world and securing family wealth? <laughs> don't know, don't know. So um, bad management comes in. Fractional reserve, obviously the old, good old-fashioned fractional reserve uh, functions, which which banks and we've been dealing with in the fiat world. You know, it's really gone full circle. It's gone like, yeah, Bitcoin, right, uh, and then back to Tether. <laughs> it's, just, it's amazing. 
uh, uh, global banking crisis, obviously, if you have a large amount of fiat sitting in banks, you are also paying negative interest rates in, in, um, in Europe. Uh, so that sort of model breaks. Uh, but also, if you have a massive banking crisis, the, the, the bank accounts that your fiat is stored in is only insured to, or in America, 250k, or in Europe, 100k. So it's, it's really going to break. Um, obviously, they're, they're uh, you know, invested in T-bills and other things, but uh, still, banking crises. So, um, algorithmic stablecoins, while really interesting, and you know, you say, ah, oh, they're really capital efficient. You know, is it? How capital efficient was Luna? Uh, it's pretty efficient at destroying capital. But, um, uh, it, you know, obviously, it's, it's still a pipe, it's a dream, but it might be a pipe dream. It might never come to reality. I think it's something worth still looking at. And why, why you know, I, I, I don't jump straight to scam because scams are very strong and powerful and important word. And I think it's overly used in the crypto space because um, it's, you need to say, hey, BitConnect is a scam. They're literally not building what they say they are and they're trying to get your money and run with it. Like, uh, and then there's experiments and, and, you know, I don't know, maybe Don Quo was a scammer, maybe it was an experiment, but a lot of projects in this space are experiments and this is what's beautiful, right? Um, during, uh, you know, communism usually ends up with like gulags and real hardcore versions of experiments where you have to like, really destroy people's lives to experiment. But in crypto, yeah, some of these experiments can destroy people's lives as well, so let's not fool ourselves, but um, it's kind of voluntarily. So, uh, Maximilian from Money on Chain, uh, we had uh, Neville uh, from Reserve, Nevin, sorry, and, uh, and we, who else we had? Uh, you. Me, I was there. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I was there. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, from from Make It Now. Yeah, so um, uh, we, we were at, at uh, La Big Conf in 2019. This is a accurate prediction made in December of 2019 at a blockchain conference. I think that um, the biggest risk, the thing that could go really massively awry with stablecoins that could be terrible for the crypto world overall, is if there's an algorithmic stablecoin that has no backing. That, that just has a sort of algorithmic mechanism. Um, but but there, there's a category called algorithmic stable coins. I would put Terra and Solo in this category. There are a number of others. Basis was like this and they never launched. Um, the thing that could happen is one of those could launch and be marketed very effectively and be significantly adopted. It could even happen in a market where people really, really need a stable currency and don't have one. And that's why it gets massively adopted. People who are not crypto speculators, people who just want to preserve their savings. If that protocol then blows up economically and falls apart, and the price of that goes you know, down to half or close to zero, it looks very backlash. Imagine if we were sitting here today talking about how great our stablecoins were, where it had already been the case that like a billion dollar stablecoin had collapsed and lots of innocent people had lost their money. You know, it would be a very different situation. Um, and, and that really could happen. There are economic experiments being run with some stablecoins that I believe personally could go that direction. And so I think yeah. the worst thing that could happen is if one of those gets really big before it fails. Yeah. Why people really use that? Terra will tell you that like hundreds of thousands of Yeah, and, and it goes on. So I, I, I think it's definitely well worth going back to the big conference and watching the whole talk uh, where we really discussed this uh, and, and now it's happened, it's come to light. So um, it, it's, it's really important when we're experimenting with this stuff to realize that we, we could, just like Mark sitting in his uh, dingy apartment was just sort of conjuring up economic ideas, which led to really a lot of suffering. It, 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 some people in the space could conjure up ideas, which could also lead to suffering. Like I said, <coughs> voluntarily, you have to voluntarily join in, um, which is a bit different. But but it's important to um, to realize that uh, yeah, it, it, it can be dangerous. But not only for that, for the entire industry. So in that talk, we we mentioned as well that regulators then come along and really pushed down, and we're seeing papers directly quoting Terra Luna now, and, uh, and and sort of chucking the whole crypto industry into that pot, which is ridiculous. But, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's definitely uh, something that, uh, if, if you're a power-hungry megalomaniac, you would do, right? Um, so, it brings us to open collateralized stablecoins, and, and I feel this is closer to a panacea <laughs> uh, in stablecoins than anything else, because... 
it sort of go, it goes back to the gold standard. The gold standard was uh, you know the government holding a whole bunch of bullion, uh, hopefully above reserve, and saying, well, you know, we'll issue some some receipts for this, and and you can always come and claim that. So there's effectively a backing. Um, over collateralized, you have to still trust the smart contracts, and so this is where like trust is is still there. People talk about Bitcoin being trustless, but that's also bullshit because if you're not a coder, you have to trust the code, you have to trust you know that you don't have some shitty virus and all sorts of stuff. Um, that takes us to the standard and what we're building. Uh, you know, really, we envisage envisage envisage. Uh, it is typical of very, I could say that from many crypto projects, but it's a, uh, a fair and open financial system backed by rare assets in which currencies are sustainably created by people and not by banks. Um, here we have the uh, stablecoin landscape when they launched. Uh, it stayed pretty much flat up until 2020, and then we really saw the exponential growth uh, of stablecoins, and we went pretty much in two years from uh, from a few billion to 200 billion, and it's set to cross the one trillion mark according to some someone. I don't know. <laughs> there are some references there, but uh, uh, that will cross the one trillion trillion mark by 2025. Um, let's see. Let's see. But uh, never, nevertheless, there definitely is a use case, especially in developing countries. And I I hope. You know, I used to always say that like, Satoshi came around at the exact right time. Because governments were already heading towards digital. I mean, they already had, you know, banks were mainly digital. And we would only head more and more into some sort of tyrannical bondage that that, um, that the state can put you in. And, and with the talks of CBDCs, even though they're, they're mostly hot air, um, it, the dream is still to control every single transaction down to the nth degree. And so, so being able to have a decentralized version, that's really cool. So... So what we're uh, really trying to build here is uh, kind of like Maker 2.0, uh, 3.0, 4.0, um, where we uh, uh, we, we want to enable with the standard the ability to mint as many currencies as possible uh, from collateral that's locked up. And um, there's a, a governance uh, token for the DAO as well. Um, and, uh, and you can lock up uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, but also tokenized gold. And this is one of the things I wanted to look at was when central banks take over clients uh, from normal banks, what will happen to these banks? I do feel that these banks will turn into what old school banks used to be. And that's just basically custodianships and vaulting facilities. And, um, and, and these, these places also need a type of uh, CEPA network sort of equivalent um, for the modern age. So I, I feel like there's something there. There's an opportunity there that's coming. It's not quite there yet, but um, these volumes, people will still use these facilities. Banks will pretty much become like fintech resellers, which they already are. A lot of the time, they're just selling insurance and all this other crap uh, to you, but also like savings, software, and, and stuff like that. But they also allow you to lock up real-world assets like gold and silver, maybe, or you know, paintings or whatever. Um, and... Uh, and allow you to uh, store them. So being able to use them and lock lock that value into a, into a smart contract and then borrow against it um, is is a really nice uh, nice idea. So that, that's how it works. You, you basically take uh, wrap Bitcoin or Bitcoin and, and uh, Ethereum and uh, as well as tokenized gold, put it in to the smart contract. Let's say you've got ten grand in there. You can borrow five grand, or let's say you've got one hundred bucks in there. The more in the developing world, you know, you really want to scale this down to smaller amounts as well. So you put uh, 100 bucks in, you can get you know 50 bucks, up to 80 80 euros out, and uh, and that's the liquidation point, And we can talk about that later. But, um, if you've played with Maker, uh, you, you should really understand that. But I, I I really find Maker fascinating. I think what they did and what Money on Chain has done as well is absolutely glorious and. And uh, I think the future, and the more that we can organize to lock up assets, and I've seen Michael Saylor talk about it too, it's the perfect way to use Bitcoin as a store of value, but then borrow against that and use that as liquidity. And it also helps people living, uh, that, that most of like 70% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, and I'm guessing that's the same around the world. So having the ability, uh, you know, a lot of these people, they, they don't have the ability to save, 
because, well, there's no liquidity left for anything else. But if you could set up a structure where you didn't need to trust a pawn, <coughs> didn't need to trust a pawn shop, um, uh, that's P A W N um, for your filthy minds. Um, it, 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 you don't need to trust them you, because you can trust a smart contract where you have the keys to. And um, and I think I think there's really something to that, and um, uh, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to to building it out. Of course, ecosystems are really important, and, and launching um, launching this stuff is is really hard. Um, how do you launch a stablecoin, especially? Uh, there's certain attack vectors when you're when you're a baby in the cradle um, that, that are really tricky. Um, so deep liquidity at launch, uh, as deep liquidity as possible, is really important because uh, it doesn't matter what sort of mechanisms you use to peg um, uh, your your stablecoin to the to the thing you're pegging to. Um, if you don't have enough liquidity, you're just going to get destroyed. And there's a lot of like fun game theoretical ways of getting yield as an attacker from this. So we're working on that <coughs> um, a lot. But yeah, I'm really excited to see what happens there. And, and um, you know, we, we have competition as well as colleagues in the space building also great stuff across different chains. So one of one of our major uh, bits of R&D is how to do cross-chain minting rather than going from bridge to bridge so that you can uh, lock up assets on one chain and then decide on which chain to mint the uh, the loan or the debt um, from yourself, and uh, because what we're seeing is as much as dogma as we have around Bitcoin or Ethereum, um, there, there are other chains in other communities, and they're, they're growing very very quickly. And if the DAO decide, okay, this is secure enough for us to, to offer offer minting on, then uh, then let's do it. Because uh, even with something like Litecoin, uh, we see uptake in Litecoin in certain parts of, uh, of Asia a lot more than Bitcoin. And, um, and this is constantly waxing and waning, of course, but uh, you know, it's definitely, we don't want to ignore certain, certain chains and just be dogmatic. I'm, uh, many people, because I'm surrounded by a lot of Bitcoin maximalists, <laughs> they put me in that basket as well, but I would consider myself more of a competition maximalist because I, I feel that competition keeps the bastards honest. And, um, and yeah, that's my talk. Thank <laughs> you.